Hello, this is Dr. Jim Thomas, and I want to welcome you to Fayetteville First Baptist Online. My hope and prayer for you today is that you're encouraged in your faith and challenged to walk toward a Christ-centered life. If you have any questions about today's message, or would like to have more information on what it means to follow after Jesus Christ, please don't hesitate to email me at info at fayettevillefbc.org. I hope you're encouraged today. May God bless you. Good morning, church. Stand with us. Let's sing together. His love awakens us. It may be gloomy outside, but His presence is here. Sing with us. There were walls between us. By the cross you came and broke them down. And broke them down. There were chains around us. By your grace we are no longer bound. No longer bound. You call me out of the grave. You call me into the light. You call me strength every day is alive in us through the power of Jesus Christ. Let's continue to sing to him this morning.
his presence here this morning, church. We serve a wonderful God. Continue to sing with us this morning.
choir worship team for leading us this morning. Can we thank our worship team this morning? Thank them for everything they do. It's one of my favorite times of the year, though it's not annually, is the Olympic Games. How many of you love the Olympics? How many of you have been watching the Olympics? Isn't it fun? It's when we get to see people with brooms on ice. I mean, what else do you need, right? I mean, it's just great stuff. And I guess because I grew up in Texas and I grew up in 120 degree temperatures in the summer, I, I like the summer games, but there's something about the Winter Olympic Games that I just really, really love. And it's probably because it's not so hot. I don't know. But I, and there's a lot of sports that I just, I, I never watch on a regular basis like skeleton. I'm just saying. It got to be a little bit of crazy in there, okay, to go head first down an uh, ice pit, right? And maybe that's why they call it skeleton. I don't know uh, that. But I love the Olympic Games. I love the opening ceremony. Anybody watch the opening ceremony the other night? Yeah, that was a lot of fun, and I thought the Koreans did a great job. Uh, phenomenal uh, cultural stuff and all that type of things, but I love the Parade of Nations. And when everybody walks in under their own flag and they come in, and of course, uh, this was highlighted by North and South Koreans marching in in unity, at least for that day, um, as they came in together. And what an incredible statement of peace that made. But for me, I'm just talking for me, it probably doesn't affect anybody else in the room, but I love when the United States walks in, amen? And I tell you what. And they come in and they carry the flag and they do their thing. And all these young people, and they seem like they're getting younger every two years when they do this. And they come in. And just the spirit that they have. I think it was summed up in one of our Olympians, uh, Mommy Biney. Uh, Biney. Has, have anybody seen the interview with Mommy beforehand? Mommy is for, actually from Ghana. And she moved, her father moved her uh, family to Boston. Talk about a cultural experience, right? And so they leave Africa, they come to Massachusetts, they get plugged in there, and there was an offer in the community for ice skating lessons. Well, they had not seen snow up to that point, much less ice skated. And so she said, I'm interested in this. She gets involved in that, tries figure skatings, and then realizes she's too fast for that. So she learns how to speed skate. And now as an 18-year-old young lady, she is one of our speed skaters at the Olympics. And when they interviewed her, Apollo Anton Ono interviewed her uh, during the opening ceremonies. He said, what are you thinking? And she almost couldn't stop giggling to answer his questions. She was so excited just to be at the Olympics and to be, come from where she had come from. And she gave God all the glory in her dad being obedient to what God had led him to do to lead the family to the United States and now put his daughter in a position such as this to be able to compete for our country. What an incredible, incredible story. And the thing that hit me most was even though all of these different athletes won our first gold yesterday, young man, 17 years old, he, he participated in the uh, get your snowboard and put it on a rail and then flippy flip thing. That was the name of the event. And he did that really well because he won the gold medal, beat out a Canadian for that. Sorry, Canadians in the room. But he beat out a Canadian for that and got the first medal for the U.S. and the first gold medal for the U.S. In the same. And I love, even though these athletes are about excelling in what they're doing, and that's part of the deal, right? They've trained their whole lives so far for this. They're representing something bigger than themselves. And they're excited, for the most part, to be about something bigger than just what they're doing. I heard an interview uh, with Scott Hamilton uh, the other day, who obviously a famous American Olympian ice skater, uh, figure skater back in the 1980 Olympics. He, he ended up on the podium the next Olympics. But, and he started to talk about his experience in Lake Placid in 1980. And you know what he started talking about? He said, I had a great experience, but man, I loved it when the hockey team won. And I loved it when this happened. And I sat across a table from one of the most famous downhill skiers ever, and I just kind of ate dinner in front of him. It was awesome, you know, that type of thing. They were about something bigger than themselves. And I wonder as a church if we're about that. Because uh, can, can I just be honest with everybody in the room? We're selfish, aren't we? We're about ourselves. How much time do you spend looking in the mirror in the morning? Bob and Day and I don't spend a lot of time. We don't need a lot of <laughs> so a little spit, shine, and go, right? But how much time do you spend on yourself every day? Not only in your actions, but in your thinking. And how many times do you wake up in the morning and think, today I'm going to live for something bigger than myself. Today I'm going to live for others, and more importantly, today I'm going to live for the God that's made me and redeemed me. 
Well, I think we all desire to be part of something bigger than ourselves, whether it may be in our family, our community, our nation, our world. We all desire to make an impact for the greater good. Now, over the past five weeks, if you're just joining us this morning, we've discovered that the church is to be about God's kingdom, something bigger than ourselves. And the forward movement of that kingdom into the world as it is empowered by the Holy Spirit of God to do so through our witness and the community of faith that we call the church. We've also learned that this kingdom life is not lived out programmatically necessarily, but specifically through, um, through everyday routines as we recognize needs and bear witness to and live out the principles of Jesus, being faithful witnesses in every area of our lives, even when we are persecuted for our faith. We're called to do this through an active faith in God, believing and trusting that he is working in and around our lives, that he is not absent, that he has not gone away, but that he is present and that he lives in us through the power of his spirit and is working to extend and multiply, if you will, his kingdom in and through our lives. I've given you two definitions throughout the series. We're going to go over them again today because I think we need to continue to reset that starting line, if you will, to use athletic metaphor. But we want to understand what two things are so that we can better understand what this means to multiply the kingdom of God. The first thing is simply this, is what is the church? Well, we've defined the church as this, the redeemed, those who've been bought back by Jesus, and gathered. We are individually redeemed by Jesus, but gathered into a larger community of the people of God. And we have been commissioned to multiply the kingdom of God throughout the world. So not only have we been redeemed, we have the promise of eternal life in Jesus, but we have been gathered together for a specific purpose, and it's a commission to go out into the world and multiply the kingdom of God, something bigger than us, in the world. So what is the kingdom of God? We've defined that for you as well. It is the already, because Jesus ushers in the kingdom when he comes to earth 2,000 years ago, but not yet because Jesus will come back and will consummate his kingdom for all of eternity. So it's the already but not yet reign or rule of God over all things. And therefore, what the church is, as the redeemed and gathered people of God, our mission, our co-mission, is to go out and to share this rule or reign of God with everyone that we come in contact with. And as we see that multiplied by the power of God's spirit through the witness of his church, we see people's lives around us transformed for eternity. And it speaks to our key truth for this series, which is simply this, that the local church is not a destination, but a base of operation. The local church is not a destination. It's not where you end up. It's not the ending line, if you will. It is the starting line for how God would have you to be used for his glory and the multiplication of his kingdom in the world. David Platt, who is the uh, president of the International Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention, said this one time. He said, you and I, can choose to continue with business as usual in the Christian life and in the church as a whole, enjoying success based on the standards defined by the culture around us. What would some of those standards be? Well, the the number of people that show up at your church on Sunday, the, the amount of money that we have in the budget or in the coffers of the church, how many programs we run on on a daily basis. All of these are not necessarily bad things, but they could be measurements that the world uses as well, right? When I came as your pastor, I told the pastor search committee almost six years ago now, I told them this, I said, I don't want to build a big church, I want to build a healthy church. Because I believe a healthy church will grow in size, but size isn't the goal. Health is the goal. Spiritual maturity is the goal. So we can can have the world standards of what the church ought to look like and measure how the church ought to be, or we can look at something different. Platt continues and says this, For the greatest way to achieve social and cultural transformation is not by focusing on social and cultural transformation, but by giving our lives to gospel proclamation, to telling others the good news of all God has done in Christ and calling them to follow him. How does the culture in the United States change? One heart at a time as we proclaim the good news of Jesus and as he transforms us from the inside out. You see, when Jesus transforms us from the inside out, which, by the way, is not religion, when Jesus transforms us by our faith in him, our response of faith to him, by the grace he's demonstrated to us, we will begin to act differently than we did before. That's the transformational power of the gospel. When we understand who Jesus is, what he's done, and what he's promised to do, he will change us from the inside out, and we will desire to live like he lives. And when we desire to live like he lives, cultures change. Because we start to live out the principles of what we were created to be and do in the first place. 
Well, over the course of the spring and summer, we're studying through the book of Acts, if you're with us for the first time, and we're investigating how the early church was commissioned, empowered, and sent to multiply the kingdom of God both locally and around the world, as Brother Tom prayed a few minutes ago. And as we see God's activity in the lives of these early believers, we will begin to understand, if we haven't already, his mission and purpose for the church today. So, today we're in chapter 6 of Acts. Um, We got there because last week we were in chapter 5. Just making sure you're awake, okay? So today we're in chapter 6 of Acts, and we're going to look at the second internal uh, controversy within the life of the early church. So if you have your Bibles of any format today, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 6. We're going to read the entire chapter because it's only 15 verses. But Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 15, if you wouldn't mind standing in the honor of the reading of God's Word. Acts chapter 6, starting in verse 1. If you don't have a Bible with you, the text should be on the screen. This is the Word of the Lord. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and many, a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians and of the Alexandrians and of those from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly instigated men who said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. And they set up false witnesses who said, This man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Well, let me catch you up a little bit on where we've been so far, because this is a transitional point in the book of Acts. Well, we've seen that in its first few months, the early church grew at an exponential rate. From the 120 who were gathered in an upper room waiting for the coming of the Holy Spirit in chapter 1, verse 15, to over 3,000 that were added after uh, Peter preached at Pentecost, to 2,000 more after Peter's sermon in Solomon's portico in verse 4, and the countless number of more that came to Christ through the everyday ministry of the church, which we saw back in in chapter 2 and in chapter 5. The kingdom of God was multiplying in Jerusalem. And we need to remember that we're still in Jerusalem in the story here because... The whole book of Acts is centered on Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And as the early disciples, the early church, are empowered by the Holy Spirit, they are empowered to be witnesses, to give testimony to who Jesus is, first in Jerusalem and then spreading to the rest of the world. We'll see that transition begin to happen in chapter 6. But right now, they are still in Jerusalem. We, We estimate at this point the number in the church, again from that 120, probably being between five and 10,000 members at this point. We don't know because of the daily uh, witness of the church and how many came to Christ every day. We have these big events that we can judge numbers by, but what about the daily witness and many came to Christ and many came to Christ and many came to Christ. We see that all the way through these first couple chapters. And so the church most likely was five to 10,000 people. Well, if there's 100 to 200,000 people within Jerusalem, if that's the population, you're talking about five to 10% of the population now has become followers of Jesus. Now, we consider that a significant minority to the point where chapters 4 and 5 leading up to what we're talking about today start to make sense of this opposition from the Jewish leaders, right? If it was 12 guys over here making a ruckus, they could take care of that. You start talking in the five to 10,000 range, you're talking about systematic opposition from those who were in charge of the government 
and the Jewish religion at the time. So that's kind of the environment we're talking about here. They, the disciples, the church had experienced power when the Holy Spirit had come upon them in chapter 2. Persecution at the hands of the Jews in chapters 4 and 5. Boldness as they prayed in chapter 4 verse 29. Unity and fellowship together again in chapter 2 and chapter 4. Internal threats to that unity at the beginning of chapter 5. God's power working through them in the greater community in the middle of chapter 5. And then God's deliverance for the sake of his gospel and kingdom at the end of chapter 5. And then we come to chapter 5 verse 42. Now you have to remember that the Sanhedrin, the ruling body of the Jews, had told the disciples and the church no longer to preach and teach in the name of Jesus. They had told them this twice. The second time they told them this, they beat them. They flogged them. Then we get to verse 42, and I love this because it just ends this section of Scripture in a way that you may not expect it, because what would you do if you had just gotten beaten because you had disobeyed the law in that area? What would you do? Would you go hide away? Would you move to another area? Verse 42, every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. Why? Because he had radically changed their lives. And they understood that by walking with him and his death and his resurrection, which was their key witness, and now seeing lives being changed around them, that this is who God had promised us as the Messiah. He is Jesus of Nazareth. And no matter what type of pushback, no matter what type of opposition we may get, we will not stop proclaiming what we have seen and heard. And so we see this continuing to happen as the gospel and the kingdom of God is expanded, is multiplied out throughout Jerusalem. But as I said earlier, now we transition into chapter 6 and we see a second internal conflict within the local church. The first happened at the beginning of chapter 5 when Ananias and Sapphira show up and and a lot of the people were bringing uh, money to the apostles' feet and putting it in a general coffer to help meet needs, right? Ananias and Sapphira sell a piece of land, they bring it, and they hold back some for themselves, but give the appearance that they've given everything. So trying to elevate who they are in the eyes of the church and maybe even in the eyes of God, well, God doesn't like that very much. And so Peter says to them, one at a time, they weren't in the room together, but one at a time he says, you've lied and deceived the Holy Spirit. And God enacts judgment and kills both of them. Well, fear gripped the church and it gripped the community. And yet, even in God preserving the integrity of his people and the church, there was, even though there was fear, there was great respect for the local church because they saw something supernatural going on in them. So now, at the beginning of chapter 6, we see the second internal conflict come up in the church. And we can break this down in our understanding of how we do church today in three ways. The first thing we need to understand, you can write this in, is that there are kingdom needs. There are kingdom needs. There are needs within the kingdom of God. You know why? Because y'all are needy people. Y'all know that? Y'all are needy people. I'm going to include myself in there because I am too, but I just want to put it on y'all first. Y'all are needy people. Y'all all have needs. You know why y'all all have needs? It's because we're sinners saved by grace. And we still struggle with our sinful nature and we still make decisions that are outside of God's will. And we have the world pressing in on us and we have internal pressure from our families and our relatives and how we're managing our money and how we raise our children and how we're doing marriage and and then from the outside from a world that doesn't want anything to do with Jesus. And we're trying to live that out in, in our work life and in our family life and in our school life and wherever we happen to be and we have this pressure and we have needs in our lives. You know, why don't all our needs go away when we receive Jesus as our Savior? That's a good question, isn't it? Why don't all our needs go away? Because it reminds us of the fallen world we still live in and the Savior we still need to depend on. And as we depend on him every day and he sanctifies us, there's your theological word for the day, as he conforms us more into the image of himself in character, we have to be fully dependent upon him. And so we have needs in our lives. And you know what? The church, as it was growing, had to meet those needs. Many of you know I'm part of an organization called the Bonhoeffer Project, and it's named after Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the martyr, German martyr in World War II. But our purpose is this. It is to create disciple-making cultures and environments in churches across the world. 
And so I've become part of their national faculty, and I train pastors and leaders from across the nation. My last cohort had uh, pastors from three different states. Uh, it's, it's a cross-denomination, though my cohorts have all been Southern Baptist. And the exciting news for me, it may not excite you at all, but it excites me is that we've just uh, entered into a partnership with the Georgia Ma uh, Baptist Mission Board to disciple pastors, Baptist pastors in the state of Georgia to create disciple-making environments in their churches, which could transform our state as we raise up people that don't go to church but follow Jesus. And so as this starts to happen, we started about four years ago with one small cohort in Southern California, and starting this year, we'll have 25 cohorts of pastors across the nation, as well as uh, several cohorts in Canada and in the UK. And we see, we're seeing God do incredible exponential things through this, and then we got to figure out how to organize it, because we hadn't been here yet. And so new problems are coming up and new needs are coming up. And as we deal with new people, different needs are coming into the situation. And so we as a leadership team have to get together and we've got to wrestle through all of this stuff. That's exactly what happened in the early church. You see, as any movement grows, it begins to organize to help sustain that movement and address any issues that might threaten its existence, whether internally or externally. So the early church, again, was no different. In verse 1, we see this, that in those days, the disciples were increasing in number and an internal situation developed that threatened to sideline the momentum and the growth of the church. Here's what happened. Luke says that a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. Now, that word complaint there means this, complaint. Thank you. It means murmuring. It means griping. It's not a positive word. It's not like, oh, there's a need. Let's go talk to Pastor Peter about it. It's not that thing. It's we're being neglected, blah, 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 murmur, 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 complain, 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 complain. That's what was going on. Now, the reality of the situation is that's what was going on. But Luke starts to show us how the early church dealt with the issue of griping and complaining and meeting needs in the early church. So, so what was the situation? The Hellenists were Greek-speaking Jews from the dispersion or their descendants. And so, again, we've talked about this before. After the Assyrian captivity and the Babylonian captivity in the Old Testament, Jews were dispersed all over the known world at that point, right? And so their descendants continued to live in those areas. Some of them would make their ways back into uh, Judea and Jerusalem, which some of these have. But they primarily spoke Greek, the language of the world at the time. Well, after coming uh, to believe, oh, excuse me, and they, they would uh, go to synagogues in Jerusalem and, and the surrounding area where Greek was primarily spoken. After coming to believe in Jesus as the Messiah, they had joined the church and were in close fellowship with Christian Hebraic Jews or Jews who had grown up in Judea or in Israel. And those, who, and those spoke primarily Aramaic, uh, maybe less likely Hebrew, and some of them spoke Greek too. We know that because Paul and Peter both spoke Greek. Their complaint centered around the sense discrimination, as Peterson says, in the impressive ministry of love and generosity provided in the daily distribution of food to those in need. In this case, widows. So you have to remember, like we said last week, there wasn't the Kroger, or as my mother-in-law says, the Walmarts. You know, There wasn't that. You didn't go down, stock up for the week, stock up for two weeks, any of that type of stuff. You had to feed your family every day from the fresh produce that was available at that time. And so those who were not able to feed themselves like these widows would have to be taken care of. And so that was the issue. And again, the complaint was that they were not being taken care of. So most of the women in that day spent their lives in households that belonged to their fathers and then after they married to their husbands and controlled little property and had little economic opportunity. So if their father had died and their husband had died, in that culture, they would be pretty desolate. And so they would need someone to help provide for them. So when widowed, they were particularly vulnerable economically and socially. Now, here's the amazing thing about Jesus and Christianity is that was really one of the first world movements that really validated women as real people. Before that, and in every other movement, whether it be the pagan movements in Rome or in Greece, whether it be the, even the Jewish movement, women were, for the most part, seen as cattle, seen as property. Jesus elevated the role of women. We even see that in the, uh, in the resurrection accounts. 
the first one to give testimony of the resurrection of Jesus was who? Mary, right? Elevating her status before God and before man. So, therefore, any neglect of a group, any group in the community, including these widows, where it was claimed that there was no needy person or, uh, among them in chapter 4, verse 34, would have been problematic and was potentially very divisive matter. It seems that old prejudices and resentments may have reappeared when practical problems relating to the care of widows became obvious. You know, you can talk a good game in your Christianity, to put it in our context, but when real problems come up, it's amazing how our Christianity flutters away. Well, I believe this. Great. Well, this is happening. Well, you better not do that, but I'll punch you in the name of Jesus. You know, that type of thing, right? Where is our walk with Jesus when the real problems hit our lives? And that's what they were kind of dealing with here, and that's why the griping and complaining had started. David Peterson, in his commentary on Acts, puts it this way, and I love how Luke deals with this. Luke does not gloss over the conflicts and difficulties of the early church. He doesn't try to hide anything. But in reporting problems, he regularly focuses on the way that they were resolved. He admits, when you get a bunch of needy people together, there are going to be problems. There are going to be opinions, and there are going to be different levels of spiritual maturity. And when we gather that together, which is a great holy mess, guess what? There are solutions to those problems. Peterson says this, Christians in every age and social context need to be aware of the threat that cultural and racial differences can pose to their unity in Christ. Why do we gather in this room today? Is it because of who you are or because of who Jesus is? It's because of who Jesus is, right? I, I'm going I'm to let you in on a few things this morning. Can I do that? Can, can we talk? Is that okay? We got some white people in the room. Do y'all know that? Do y'all, did y'all look around today? We got some white people in the room today. We got some African American people in the room today. Do you know? Come on, be proud. We've got some Asian people in the room today. Come on, in the back corner. We've got some Hispanic people in the room today. Yeah. We've got some Brazilians in the room today. Yeah, go team. Um, we've got Republicans in the room today. Y'all lean in. We've got a few Democrats here too. I left out the Libertarians in the first service. I apologize, okay? We've got some Independents in the room as well. And you know what's craziest? The craziest thing of all. We've got Yankees in the room. We got Yankees in the room, folks. How much are you going to love Jesus now, right? Now, <laughs> let me just say this. That, my friends, is a picture of the kingdom of God. Because we don't gather based on the color of our skin or what culture we grew up in or what our specific political ideology is. We gather because Jesus has saved us and redeemed us and changed us and called us. And that doesn't mean we don't disagree. It means we come together in a fellowship where we can talk honestly and lovingly with one another to encourage one another in our walks with Christ and build each other up for his kingdom's sake in the world. Here, let me prove it to you. The Apostle Paul said this in Colossians 3.11. He's talking, he opens with the word here. That means in the Christ life, in this new walk with Jesus. He says, here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free. But Christ is all and in all. You see, the reason we gather is because Jesus is the Christ. He is all and is in all. And therefore, our common bond when we come in this room is not your socioeconomic situation. It's not your past. It's not your history because we all bring baggage in the room. Some of you bring suitcases. Some of you bring trunks. I get it. But we all bring our baggage into the room. And guess what? We get to do life together then. At least that's what the Bible says. So how should we treat one another if this is what the kingdom of God looks like? Philippians 2. So if there's any encouragement in Christ any comfort from love, 
Any participation in the Spirit, which means that you have a relationship with Jesus because you don't have the Spirit of God in your life outside of a faith relationship with Jesus. So any participation as a body in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy, Paul says, by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility. Count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. There are needs in the church. There are needs in the kingdom that we are called to meet. So how do we do that? Well, that's our second truth today, that there are kingdom roles. Not only are there kingdom needs, but there are kingdom roles. So in response to this need in Acts chapter 6, the 12 summoned the full number of the disciples. Now that was a church conference. If you're talking five to 10,000 people showing up, how many opinions entered wherever they were, right? I would say five to 10,000, right? So they summoned the number of disciples to them and made a proposal about providing practical care for, the, for these members of the church. Here's what they said. It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, that means of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, we'll get back to that in a second, whom we, we will appoint to this duty, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Now, I I need to be very clear here. When the apostles said this, it was not some type of uppity statement. It wasn't a statement of prestige that they're gonna be about this, but you people can go handle that mess over there. That's not what it was at all. It wasn't an issue of prestige, it was an issue of priority. Because the apostles understood this, that there was a need in the church and they needed to meet that need, but that God had set them apart for a specific role in the church. And their role was prayer and the ministry of the word. Because that's how the kingdom had grown at that point, right? Through equipping believers to be able to share the gospel with the world around them. And so as they fulfilled that role, They could not be sidetracked or distracted by other even necessary roles within the life of the church. And so here's what they did. And and, and I need to say this, that didn't make them exempt from any type of pastoral care. The last two chapters, we see Peter and John healing people, meeting needs, rejoicing with them, defending their healing, all of those things. So we see them, but it's an issue of priority. In fact, Tom Rayner, president of LifeWay, once said this. uh, This was in a blog about uh, six months ago. He said, here are the three primary roles of a pastor or a pastoral staff in the church. Prayer, preaching and teaching, and leadership. That doesn't mean they don't do other things, but those are the primary roles in the life of the church. Why? Because the Apostle Paul said this, that those who are called out to spiritual leadership in the church from a pastoral position, their main job is one thing to equip the saints for works of ministry i've had five conversations this week with people who have lost loved ones i've been to a funeral yesterday i'll be at a funeral tomorrow it's not that pastors don't do the other stuff but there are priorities and in this situation the apostles saw that this was not their priority in extending the kingdom and so they said okay then what do we do about this they were dedicated to meeting the needs of the poor among them And as a result, they argued that it would not be right or appropriate for them to give up or to neglect or to forsake, those would be the same words, preaching the word of God to serve tables. If they're going to devote themselves, and that's the same word or verb to devote themselves as it was in Acts 2 when it said that the early believers devoted themselves to the the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to, uh, to worship, and to prayer. Same word here. If they were going to devote themselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word, then another solution must be sought. So the apostles' proposal pleased the whole gathering. That's never happened in a church conference in the history of mankind, right? That doesn't mean that everybody agreed to it. I mean, that doesn't mean that everybody's personal preference was settled. What it means where it pleased everybody is that everybody was in agreement that this was the will of God. You see why prayer is so important for the local church? Because if we're not asking Jesus' opinion about his church, then we failed as his church. Because it's not your church and it's not my church, it's his church. So before we move forward and do anything, and I guarantee you our pastoral staff does this, we ask Jesus what he wants to do. And then we do our best to obey him. And that's what happened in this case when it says that it pleased the whole gathering. They all agreed that this was God's will. So they chose Stephen. 
a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. And I want to stop there for a second. So what are these servants, these people who are going to fulfill this other role, look like? Well, first it says up here, pick out from among yourselves seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit, because you're not a believer in Jesus unless you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, which comes by faith in Jesus, right? And of wisdom, so if you, these men are, have the Spirit, then they have wisdom. And now with Stephen, we see that he has faith. Now, why is that so important? Because the people that brought this issue to the disciples were complaining. They were grumbling. They were griping about something that was a real need in the church. You see, the need was real. The motive to bring that to leadership was faulty, though. And so did they choose those people who griped and complained and did all that? No, no, no. Who did they choose? Someone who had wisdom and faith. Because here's the bottom line, folks. When we're griping and complaining about something, that's the result of fear. Think about it for a second. Whenever you start griping about something, what are you afraid of? That a personal need's not going to get met? But these people, this type of person like Stephen, full of wisdom and faith, trusting that God can provide in all circumstances, in all situations. They go on and, and list the rest of them. Philip, um, Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, who was a proselyte of Antioch. You recognize anything with all these names? You may not. They're all Greek names, Right? It was Greek widows who were being neglected, so they raised up people that could relate to those people and sent them to minister to them. It was very strategic. They brought them to the apostles who then commissioned them for this work by praying and laying hands on them. We consider this text to be the formation of what we call the deacon body in the life of the church. The word deacon in the original Greek simply means this. It means servant. That's all it means. It doesn't mean administrator. It doesn't mean pastor. It means servant. And the deacons were raised up to supplement what the pastors were doing through prayer and the ministry of the word. And the deacons would come alongside them and they would support that ministry and meet needs in the life of the community. And that's what our deacons do here as well. In fact, I want to ask you to do something for me. If you are an ordained deacon at this church, at Fayetteville First Baptist Church, and you may not be active right now, that's fine. But if you're an ordained deacon at this church, would you just stand where you are? Just stand where you are. I want you to look around the room. These are men of God who love this church and support the ministries of this church, love and support me and our pastoral staff, and serve the needs of this local body. Can we thank them for that ministry? Thank you, men. You may be seated. Appreciate you. Richard Longnecker says this, that the early church seems to have been prepared to adjust its procedures, alter its organizational structure, and develop new posts of responsibility in response to existing needs and for the sake of on, the ongoing proclamation of the Word of God. I want, I want to let you know who just stood among you. We've set them apart because of this. Paul says this to, first, you know, to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Deacons, likewise, must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. And let them also be tested first, then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves to be blameless. Now, that word blameless doesn't mean sinless. What that word blameless means is they, they could not be convicted if they stood up, if someone accused them of doing wrong. Let me, let me put it in the positive. They would be convicted for looking like Jesus. That's what blameless means. Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. They gain a great confidence in the faith. I don't know if he's in the room, so I won't say his name today, but we had a, a younger deacon come in and he started to serve with us and just really, really uh, nervous about praying in public. And as, I, you know, as, a, as a public speaker, that's kind of what I do a lot, um, it just baffles me that not everybody wants to get up here and do this, right? And that just, that just that doesn't make sense to me. And so this young man came to me and he said, Pastor, I've never prayed publicly before. What do I do? And so we walk, walked through some tips for him and everything like that. And so the first time he was going to be deacon of the week and pray over the offering, he showed up and he had his note cards with him. I loved it. And he had written out his entire prayer on his note cards so that he wouldn't mess up and he wouldn't get nervous and he wouldn't have to look at you. 
he would look down at his note cards, right? And you know what was amazing about that? Is it was one of the most thoughtful prayers that I've heard in a long time. Why? Because he had to sit there and write it out. And then he got up and he read his prayer, and it was an incredible prayer to the Lord, right? Well, the last time he prayed, he got up there and he didn't have note cards anymore. That was about the third or fourth time he had done that, I think, at this point. And he got up there and he just prayed. He just talked to his father in front of us. You know what that is? Growing in confidence in the faith. And as we practice the faith, as we live out the faith, meeting needs, whether you're a deacon or a member of the church in any other capacity, and we'll talk about that in a second, the more you do it, the easier it gets. We go to Brazil. We're going to Brazil this week, and, and uh, we get down there, and there are some things we do that take us way outside our Western American box. But you know, by the end of the week, we're kind of like, yeah, that's what I do now. Not on day one, but maybe day nine or ten, when we feel that confidence. Why? Because we're practicing how we're supposed to live out the kingdom of God. And that's exactly what our deacons are examples of here at First Baptist Church. There are kingdom needs, there are kingdom roles. What's, what's the result of that? Well, there's kingdom impact. You see, when we identify a need in the church and address it from a biblical standpoint and fulfill the roles that God has given us in the life of the church, all of us in the life of the church, then it frees us up to extend and multiply the kingdom in the world. Here's the opposite of that. We all come together and we're all selfish and we keep fighting over the same thing over and over. Guess where we're never going to end up? Out there. Because we're too concerned about our own personal agendas. But when we can address issues biblically in love for one another, then it frees us up to step outside this building and this fellowship and be salt and light in the world and see the kingdom of God expanded exponentially. So in this context, as the church recognized needs and fulfilled their God-given roles, we see in verse 7, the word of God continued to increase and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Why is that important? Because the priests were of the group called the Sadducees who had been persecuting the disciples for the last two chapters. The Sadducees. So their continued witness into even the leadership of the nation, many priests, many of those who opposed them started to come into faith in Jesus because they saw the unity and the power within this local body. Luke then follows the ministry of two of these men. And Pastor Jack, when I'm in Brazil next week, Pastor Jack Miller will be speaking on Stephen. And then uh, two weeks from now, uh, Pastor Jim Battles will be speaking on Philip, these two men, as the kingdom is multiplied beyond Jerusalem to Judea, Galilee, Samaria, and even Syria. But not only uh, does Stephen, who was full of grace and power, so he's got wisdom, he's got faith, now he's got God's favor, his grace, and the power of the Holy Spirit working in him. Not only does Stephen fulfill his role in meeting the needs of the Hellenistic widows, but embraces a ministry of speaking and was doing great wonders and signs among the people. In Scripture, there's no uh, prerequisite that deacons in the church need to be teachers or speakers. There's no prerequisite for that. We don't see that. But just as pastors who have priorities in their ministry, preaching, teaching, leadership, and prayer, those priorities doesn't, doesn't mean we don't do the other things. Just like that, those who have been called to a servant ministry in the life of the church doesn't mean that God hasn't always also equipped them to preach and teach. Did that with Stephen? Did that with Philip? We have several of our deacons that are Sunday school teachers that lead D groups, that lead focus studies. That's their gifting, and so they're living out their gifting. It's not boxed in to just being, serving people who are in need. It goes beyond that, and we see that in the life of Stephen right here. So, as had been true of the apostles, Stephen now encounters opposition to his message, this time from the diaspora Jews who were the Jews of the dispersion, who shared Stephen's background, we see in verse 9. But these men could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. As a result, the Jews secretly instigated or, um, or produced false witnesses, men to speak falsely against Stephen, and stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes who arrested him and brought him before the Sanhedrin. Does that remind you of anybody? Like Jesus? Yeah. They again set up false, false witnesses against him, accusing him of blasphemy, one of the same charges against Jesus. And then there's verse 15. But gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was that like a face of an angel. Now, there can be two different interpretations there, I think. Number one, what was the argument of the Jews? That he was disrupting what Moses had taught them in the law. 
What happened to Moses after he came off of Mount Sinai? His face glowed with the glory in the presence of God, right? Whether that's literally what happened with Stephen, we don't know. The other thing is this. He was so filled with God's spirit and had faith and he had power and he had favor and he had wisdom that in the midst of opposition, he was completely calm. And simply, as Pastor Jack will share next week, gave a witness to Jesus being the fulfillment of the law and of everything Moses taught. And in the midst of that opposition to him, they saw his face like an angel, not deterred one bit by their threats to him. Wow. There are needs in the church, folks. There are roles. And let me just say this. Everybody in this room, if you're a Christ follower today, is a, is a missionary. Everybody in this room has a role to play in the church. And can, as, I, as your pastor, can I say this? If you're not fulfilling your role in the church, you're hurting the rest of us. Because we're meant to be one body fulfilling what God has called us to do. So if you don't know what your role is, then we're going to hopefully put some things in place in, in the coming months to help you discover that role, to discover what your personality type is. And yes, everybody in the room does have a personality. To discover what gifts God gave you, spiritual gifts, at your point of conversion. To discover what your passions are that God's been building in you through your entire life. To discover what your history is. Let's unpack that trunk, that luggage, and see where you've come from and see how God can use what you may perceive as negative to be a driving force of what he's calling you to be and do. And as we discover those roles and we start to live those roles out in the life of the body, then the wider world will see the glory of God in his people. So let me ask you this. How has God called you to meet the needs in the church? As you help meet those needs, and here's, here's the heart question today. As you help meet those needs, are you building unity or division among God's people? Because the needs are real. But how are you addressing those needs? Are you complaining, murmuring, murmuring and griping? Or are you in love, working together with others in the life of the church to be able to meet those needs from a biblical standpoint? If you do, You'll, be, you'll begin to see a kingdom impact that goes far beyond the immediate need and into the world. And we see the gospel, the kingdom of God multiplied throughout his creation.